Строй звуча, товарищ, как вы поживаете? That was Russian for Hello, my friends, how are you doing? At least I hope. It's been a while since I have uh, been instructed in uh, Russian, but I, I, I like to keep these things. I like to keep those things in mind. So, uh, please excuse the, I don't know, the roughness of the hair. It's, uh, it's the end of the night. And uh, I definitely should be thinking about going to bed. Uh, this video is a direct response to, not a direct response, but it's a direct result, rather, of uh, a poll I did on Amino D&D &D, uh, about which story would uh, you rather hear about. And I gave two choices. Uh, the first one was Roy the Godslayer, and the second one was... The Herald's Mystical Mansion. Uh, given the previous poll that I had, I, I was expecting either one, but uh, more people wanted to hear about Roy the Godslayer, so we're uh, we're doing this one. A uh, couple things that I need to make uh, very clear. Uh, the first one is that Roy wasn't actually a player. Or player character, and it, this wasn't D and D. You know, this was this was Star Wars actually, Star Wars Revised Edition. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure it was Revised Edition, because I I don't own any of the books, so I constantly get confused between Revised Edition and Saga Edition. From what I was told, uh, Revised Edition and Saga Edition both are the same system per se but one was made after the rights to the game were sold off to another company or something like that I don't I don't know the history of this shit get off my back anyway Star Wars very few people haven't heard of Star Wars and I, I can imagine that uh uh, I can imagine m pretty much most of you have seen Star Wars at some point or another. I myself have seen all six of the true Star Wars movies. I uh, I was I didn't hate The Force Awakens. I, in fact, I went into that movie wanting to hate it, but I came out pleasantly surprised. I was expecting a decent movie from the. Uh, the Last Jedi. I wanted it to be over after ten minutes. But that's not what's important here. What is important is role-playing games are awesome. Now, Roy didn't actually start out as a, uh, you know, some GM controlled NPC and he wasn't a player character as I mentioned earlier to to really drive home the importance not the uh, significance of what happened and how like why it's still remembered by myself and my uh, my group is because of the the journey that uh, that Roy was on. Here's the basic premise. Here's the backstory. I get contacted for uh, joining back up with a group that I had previously played with, uh, with a few alterations. There were few players. Uh, sorry, fewer players. And uh, so. I join in. Previous characters that I that we had weren't really going to cut it because they were more or less designed for a larger company, and a lot had happened from, you know, in between stuff. So we go new campaign, new setting, new everything. Let's go. So I'm like, great. Who do I want to play? 
And it was while I was making the character, and I, sorry, not, uh, while I was thinking about the character that I wanted to make, I'm tired. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be making a video this late. It's like two and a half, like, it's like two in the morning. Uh, I was thinking about what kind of character I wanted to make when I realized something. Out of all of my time playing Dungeons and Dragons and other role-playing games, I've never once rolled up a female character. Not once. And I thought, well, Star Wars, pretty much everything is a goddamn alien unless you go human, and why? Well, I'm just gonna say it. If you pick human in a Star Wars setting, You've either played it enough times where it just doesn't matter anymore, or uh, you want to play it a bit too safe. So, I make Jira High, a Nautolan Fringer. It, it will become apparent later on I should have made a tech specialist instead, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. Um, so we're rolling up our characters, and first session is always, uh, you know, design your characters, set up the world, and maybe have a little bit of, like, narrative to, to go with it, at least for us. And, uh, while we're rolling up our characters, we always make sure that we roll up our stats, you know, so the others can see it, make sure everybody knows, yes, this is what I rolled, yes, I totally did roll three 17s in a row, check my, check it right here. But no, um roll up the character stats, and they're fairly average. They're like 10, 16, 12, 14, 11, 5. Like every, everyone else had decent to good stats. I think the lowest they got was like a, like a 9, maybe. But their racial traits kind of got, like, bumped that up to 10 anyway, so the lowest that they had was like a 10. Me, 5. And so I knew from the very beginning that it's just... That is going to be a dump stat, and it's going to be next to impossible to uh, balance that out in, in future level-ups. So I have to think this through. And I already kind of decided, like, at the time I'd already kind of thought about, like, making a Fringer. But it was honestly because of the five I rolled that not only solidified the backstory for this character, but to this date has made her one of my favorite uh, characters. Legit, no joke, one of my one of the favorite characters, if not my absolute favorite character to play as. What? That's my roommate. What's up? He's naked. Avert your eyes, children. Or die. Or that. Yes, or that. Uh... What I decided was, I was going to put the 5 into Charisma and have her be reclusive, antisocial, shy, and a droidsmith. She has terrible social skills because she spent all of her time as a kid making droids. Bada bing, bada boom. Right there. Right there, her entire backstory, her entire character is decided for me, right there. And then, something of a personal goal can be achieved through that, like, yeah, she's antisocial as fuck, but she still has her passion. She can make friends that way. So, with that backstory in mind, and with what we were going to be doing with the character in the future, I hatched a plan. I talked to the GM, and I persuaded, hey, so, um, my character is shy. My character is kind of antisocial, but she's, she's, still a, she's still a businessman. She still makes money. Besides, you don't really need to have too much uh, social skills to just have set prices for what you need. 
And besides, she's good at what she does. She can just make droids and make some money that way. He says, yeah, makes sense. So I said, and because she's been doing this since she was a kid, is do you think it's possible that maybe I can get away with having like a droid sidekick? Like a companion droid? Like, I'm not asking for like R2-D2 or fucking BB-Jesus, I mean BB-8. Uh, just, just a little thing. A little thing that where she can just like talk to when she's feeling alone. Or just, you know, when she doesn't want to talk to anyone else, or she's just feeling particularly shy at the moment. Like, there's a little, little, little drawer the size of like a wristwatch or something like that. He's like, I'll think about it. I'll think about it. You'll, you'll hand me some more details on like what the droid would be like, though, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, sure. Like, I can think of a few things. I can think of a few things. So the rest of the week goes more into uh, deciding like what the car what the the droid would look like and I kind of decide on something that's uh, similar to Ralph if you've ever seen spy kids but a little bit more spider like and whenever Roy is in on on her arm her left mechanical arm uh, he looks almost indistinguishable from like a futuristic watch. No, but a little on the larger side, because he's still a he's still a droid. So essentially, I had a companion that's just sit on my arm the entire time, which was great. And yeah, he agreed. And the next week, I was greeted with a sheet of paper that basically had all of Roy's stats on it. Uh, the actual sketch work of what. Roy looks like isn't completely accurate, uh, but hey, I I didn't offer to to sketch him out, so I I kind of have myself to blame, and I'm sure I could redraw him if I wanted to. Uh, let's see, uh, second degree droid, plus two dex, plus two intelligence, and minus four strength, diminutive size, plus four mod uh, for defense. Basically, it's a scout class. Oh, a third one! Thank you! Get minty. Minty fresh. I mean, not minty. Cinnamon, goddamn. <laughs> yeah, the um, Cinnamon Coca Cola Limited Christmas Edition. Coke. Huh? Christmas Coke. I thought the Christmas Coke was mint. No, Christmas Coke was cinnamon. Oh. I guess Christmas Coke was cinnamon. Uh. So basically, he chose the droid and, you know, gave him a class. So he had, like, a set number of um, just basic skills that a, a scout would have that seemed, a, seemed to fit who Roy was. Uh, he was also given something called the bad wiring quirk. And he even gave the page number of 365. Uh, critical one shut down for 1d4 rounds. So basically, if I roll a 1 for anything Roy-related, I basically lose him for a minimum of like 6 seconds. Which can be quite frustrating depending on what uh, happens. Uh, but he does have a plus 2 ability modifier of choice, which I don't think I actually got the choice of. I th I'm pretty sure the, the GM just decided that on his own. Uh, let's see. Crawling ability droid. Which basically means he can just, you know, he can crawl on walls and stuff like that. Which is really useful a number of times. Uh, Scout 1, uh, let's see, initiative plus 9. So, if, if, if Roy's in combat, he's going first. Uh, defense of 25. Uh, plus 2 for class, plus 9 for dex, and a plus 4 for size. So, for those of you who have only played D&D... Defense is the Star Wars RPG equivalent to uh, armor class. So you need to meet or beat 25 in order to hit this guy. It's pretty damn good. But there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason for that is because he's got like 7 HP. And that's including vitality points. 
And vitality points is basically what you use to like shrug off blasts. His actual health points, which are wound points in this game, three. Three wound points, and then he's squished. Uh, speed, two meters per round. Uh, vitality points, four. Wound points, three. Attack at minus one. Uh, melee. Uh, 1d2 minus 1, so basically a flip of the, flip of the coin. So it's a uh, basic, best, the best thing is like 1, a, a damage. But uh, he does have a plus 13 to ranged attacks. So like if I, so if Roy is in like command of a ship or something like that, or if he's able to fire off a spell, Beater bolt or something like that. It's a plus thirteen to hit. Uh, saving stuff. Uh, fortification minus three. Reflexes plus ten, and a will of plus two. Uh, S Z D. I don't know what that means. Uh, face slash reach. So there's a, a basically a bunch of other stuff. Uh, strength 1, Dexterity of 29, Constitution of 3, Intelligence 26, sorry, Intelligence 16, I don't know where I got 26 from, I just kind of wish he had 26. Uh, Wisdom 12, and Charisma of 11, Challenge Code A. Uh, all are, like, decent stats. I think he legitimately just decided arbitrarily, like, hey, this is more or less what the droid stats would be like if I were to take it from, like, the combat manual or something like that. Because I don't think... I genuinely don't think he rolled for this. Because I, I really don't think you can roll 3d6 and get a 1 on strength. I really don't think so. Unless it's a negative 2 and you rolled, like, really shittily. And and plus, the 29 dexterity. No way you, you're rolling that with 3d6. Uh, it, skills... He's got a, ply, a climb plus two, computer use plus seven, a hide of plus 13, jump minus five, a listen a plus 12, move silently to plus 13, a pilot plus nine, repair plus seven, ride plus nine, shut up, a search plus nine, spot plus seven, and survive plus one, a swim minus five. Also, I forgot about that. Swim minus five, which is somewhat relevant, because now Tolans are aquatic. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I as a now Tolan, I can breathe underwater, which is really nice. Never came up. Never actually came up. N was never a use for me in this campaign. But I could have if I wanted to. I could have drowned my enemies and then just sat there breathing perfectly fine. Like, oh, sup, bitch. Uh, he's got, let's see, speed, sorry, feats, skill emphasis, climb, and skill emphasis, listen. So, uh, this, the climb and, and listen were basically increased by two, I think. This came in later, and I won't, I, me I won't mention it now, but it, he, he did get something later on that, uh, kind of helped him out health-wise. Uh, let's see. Equipment, and this is something that's that actually becomes relevant later on the, in the campaign that kind of... I was able to abuse the fuck out of one of these. Uh, equipment, diagnostic package, a magnetic feat, recording unit, sensors, improved sonic. One of these things I abused to fuck. I abused to hella and back, and that was the recording unit. Now, when, when I first got this sheet, this was a little much to take in because I was already worried about my character and I was technically still learning a new system. Nowadays, this would be nothing. Nowadays, I just look at all this and we go like, okay, cool. Diagnostic package, magnetic package. I got it. But back then, still learning a brand new system, I'm coming off of like D&D 5th edition where it does not look like this at all. Uh, and... I had to jump back and forth between them. So, it was something. It was definitely something to get used to. So I didn't actually remember the recording unit until about like, 
I don't know, like a month and a half in, and it became very useful when I needed information and I was able to get someone to convince, uh, to uh, admit to something. I was able to get someone to admit to something that he really shouldn't have. And I basically used it as blackmail. Because the GM forgot that Roy had a recording unit too. <laughs> oh, this, that was just the beginning of Roy's usefulness and why I loved him so much. Even more so than just role-playing it. Because Jira had an... Like, one of the unspoken rules with Jira was that she would never abandon Roy. Like, never would she ever abandon Roy and not... And would she would never, like, arbitrarily let someone just have him. Not once. They were inseparable because she's had him since she was a kid. She built him. Uh, so... Giving you a basic rundown of the campaign, because already this is a little long. Basic plot summary of the campaign. Myself, a Gungan, and whatever race Thrawn was. Hold on. Let me let me look this up. Uh, Star Wars Thrawn. Thrawn Treason. What the fuck was this? Novel by Timothy Zahn. Uh, Star Wars Thrawn Wikipedia. Articles of Grand Old Thrawn. Who the fuck is Thrawn? First appearance, created by, voiced by... Uh, full name, Species, Chiss. She was a Chiss. C-H-I-S-S. -S. There we go. So yeah, a Chiss, a Gungan, and a Nautolan are on our way to a wedding that we were invited to for, for various reasons. Uh, and we all are cho- are <coughs> We're basically told, hey, you should probably have a wedding gift planned. Mine was easy. I basically had two different droids that I was going to be gift gifting to her. Uh, the first one was a droided uh, plant pot that basically had its own uh, self-sustaining gardener program, I guess. Basically, whatever plant you put in there, the droid will analyze it through its database and uh, maintain the soil to how the plant should grow. Basically to, you know, whatever plant it is, the droid will do its best to have the soil native to that plant and it'll grow magnificently. And the second was, and I might have gone a little tongue in cheek here, a grooming droid. Because when you're a Wookiee, you got a lot of hair. You got a lot of hair. So a self-grooming, sorry, a, a droid that's programmed to groom you head to toe might be useful. And it's a droid, so it's damn good at its job. Provided that the program is okay. We are on a space yacht. We're on our way to Kashyyyk for the wedding, and we get raided. Session one well, two technically, but the session one of the actual campaign, we get raided by pirates. The Krathos Speeders. They are searching the rooms, they're occasionally killing people that resist, but for the most part, they just seem interested in looting the place. I hold out for as long as I can, because Roy is a damn good listener. And, uh, I held out for longer than the other two players, and I found out later that it was going to be kind of like a, a roll of the dice, whether or not that the Kratos speeders would just go away because they didn't necessarily want to kill people and I wasn't like actively shooting at them. So, you know, robbery is one thing, but murder is a much more severe punishment. There's a much... Yeah. But... 
I didn't I didn't know if the GM was going to be the type of, of guy that yeah, you're pointing your your blaster at like three pirates. They're going to shoot you. <laughs> I I didn't know if he was going to go that route and be all like, "Yeah, you're going to fucking die if you do this or not." I uh so eventually I gave up and thankfully they didn't take Roy. Thankfully they didn't take Roy. But they did shackle me. They did take my gun. They did take a little bit of money. But uh, I hid most of it. And uh, they didn't. They uh, they didn't uh, take my droids, which was good. The droids I was going to be gifting. Roy uses a successful computer use uh, to. Was it a computer use? I don't know if he if it was computer use or if he used something like like repair or something like that. I don't know what he did, but Roy was the the droid that basically undid the shackles on my on my wrists. So session one, he's helpful as fuck. We go off. Long story short, we we don't stop the speeders. We don't stop the Kratos speeders at that point, and uh, we get robbed. We get somewhat hired. Uh, somewhat volunteer to go and retrieve the one of the wedding gifts that was stolen called the Crate Dragon Amulet. Um, for those of you who don't know, a Crate Dragon Pearl is from the... It's from somewhere inside a Crate Dragon, which is native to Tatooine, and is fucking massive! You know the Sarlacc Pit? I was told that the fucking Crate Dragons eat them. I was told that these fucking dragons are so big and so dangerous that they will eat the very things that was a major bad guy in episode 6. Yeah. And, and the Gungans just happened to have the am a, a pearl amulet. Fucking great. We jump from a couple planets looking for information on where the Kratos speeders might be. We, uh, and this was the first time I actually used the uh, the recorder because I recorded an informant who basically smug as fuck, didn't think we could get dirt on him, admitted some admitted to something that he shouldn't have, and uh, when we were a moderately safe distance away, I let him know, hey, I've, uh, I've got you on tape. I got you on tape. This guy, this is a droid, and he recorded you saying that. You're helping us. You might be thinking, oh, that doesn't sound like a five charisma. I was like, well, it's not. But at the same time, I did say that sh like, when we got to a safe enough distance from the guy so that he just wouldn't take him. And plus, I did have a fucking Gungan and a Chiss backing me up. He was alone, so. Three on one, I think we'd win. Uh, so eventually we go from planet to another planet, and then eventually we get kicked off of one planet because we... Well, I didn't. I know that for a fucking fact. I didn't break any laws, but the other two... The Gungan definitely did. I think the Chiss... I think the Chiss actually, like was an accomplice to it at some point. I don't remember exactly what it was. But uh, we get kicked off a fucking planet as a result of it. I'm like, well, motherfucker. That sucks. And eventually we arrive on an, another planet where it's confirmed that this is the, like, the, uh, if not the home world, it's a, it's consistent. It's consistently used by the Kratos speeder pirates as I don't know, something of a, not a vacation spot, but it's definitely a common hub for them. Um, we also found out that they, not all the time, but they commonly have good relations with a kind of a cult called the Rotoderm's Legacy. And uh, this is also, this is the actual native place to the Rotoderm's Legacy cult, but we didn't necessarily know that at the time. Um, it became abundantly clear when there was a 
fucking I don't know if it's it would be if it would be called a tavern or like a bar, but when when there's a fucking tavern named after that, kind of became obvious that they're local and that people don't really see them as a as a big deal. They're basically described as religious fanatics at the time, but we knew we knew better. You're on good you're on good terms with a fucking pirate gang. You can't be on the up and up. Just not just not possible. Not possible. So, we don't have any leads at this point, uh, and we're not exactly going to make much ground without much money, so we, we find a place that's on the outskirts of town, and we kind of hold up there. The Gungan persists to piss off the owner so much that he gets kicked out. Thankfully, myself and the Chiss, whom we shall call Jess now, because that was her actual name. Was it Jess? I think it was Jess. Uh, I... I uh, yes, it was. Jess. Jess Esar. Uh, Jess Esar, the Chiss. Jess and I, we were lucky enough to not piss him off, and we were welcome inside any time. Um, he, he was basically a collector of older stuff, and um, <clears throat> we were basically hired by him to, uh, without damaging too much of the property, exterminate uh, these this hive of like giant ass bugs that have been scaring his uh, his flock and just wreaking havoc on his crops. So we go over there with this uh, new speeder which we actually did manage to purchase at some point. Uh, we called it the Hovey, the Hov V. And uh, through some tweaking, I was able to convince the owner that lent, originally lent it to us and later sold it to us. Uh, hey, can we mount a turret on the back of it? So it was basically like a tri-speeder. So larger section in the back room for three people, one in the drivers and two in, you know, in the back, and then there was enough room for like a, a trunk, right? So we retrofit the trunk to be a turret section, and that was nice. Uh, we used Roy a lot in the section where we went underground and we were just kind of like looking for things, because Roy had some damn impressive listens, so kind of following where he is, and uh, Long story short, there was something of like an infection going on down there that was the reason, that was the, the, the direct cause of those giant insect-like things wreaking havoc on the outside because they typically don't uh, venture outside of their caves or their uh, burrows for that long and most certainly not that far, but something was happening. It turns out it was like this um, <clears throat> spore infection that was just wreaking havoc on them and on like humanoids who managed to get out of there and what's more instead of actually instead of going out there and getting like proper exterminators for the job we find us uh we find some explosives we roll them down there boom light the bitch on fire and we fucking just rolled out uh he wasn't too happy with the mess we caused as a result but we got job done and uh, he liked it so much, in fact, that he kept us around. And over time, uh, we each got to take not the not Tobel of House Roan, the Gungan. He didn't get anything from this, but Jess and I did. Jess and I were able to go through basically a car, this massive garage, and like take something that we wanted. And uh, one thing, within reason. And so I, I chose a, a droid drone that's basically a vulture droid, but not, you know, not the same model. Because this was, this took place, I think, right before the Mandalorian War. I don't know when that is, but that's the time frame I was given. Uh, so, I have a, a droid drone now. And I was able to set it up so that Roy could remotely pilot it, like basically communicating with it back and forth, like the like uh, 
not like the Borg, but, you know, he's basically tapped into it all the time. And at, and at any point in time, I could tell Roy to do something, and he'd be all like, okay. Zoom. Roy doesn't speak, by the way. Just your standard beeps and boops. But I did have a... Um, did I speak binary? I think I did. Jerry Rig, Huh. I don't think I had, um... I know I didn't speak binary, but I do know that there was something of, like, a... I think it was one of those... I can't remember. This is gonna bug me. Did we just not cover that? Or was Jira just with him for so long that she just knows what he's talking about? I don't know. There might have been like a communications thing in her ear that was like, hey, this is what Roy is telling you. Um, and, I, and I get a few more droids as the campaign goes on. Like I, I start building repair droids so that at any point in time uh, I can speed up the process of further repairs to other things. like. These three repair droids plus myself could fix the, the drone if it ever got damaged in like a day as opposed to like a week. Something like that. Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, we eventually find where we're looking for. We find out that, yes, the amulet is here. It's not in the hand of the Kratos speeders. It's in the hand of the Rotoderm's legacy. And we found our culprit. Rotoderm's legacy hired the Kratos speeders to attack the space yacht and steal it. Great job, guys. Great job. But no matter how many times, like, we lose track of them, and we lost track of them a couple times, uh, the first time was not our fault. We didn't know that there was a fucking space helicopter or whatever on the roof. Um, the second time that I was not a part of. I was not a part of that one. I was not aware that there was a story element at that point. I was a, I was back at the the base, like, fixing shit. That's what I did. Uh, jumping ahead a little bit. Roy was useful when we got attacked at our hotel. Uh, I had Roy climb on the roof because there were two entrances to the floor we were on, over here and over here. We took over here and we didn't want to be split up. So I had Roy climb on the ceiling and go over to this side. You know, as a watch, and I can, I can hear him over here, so. And good luck. I mean, I don't think anyone's going to be looking up at the ceiling for fucking a scout droid. I don't think anyone's going to do that. And no one ever did, actually. But uh, we were able to fend them off quite well. Um, I... I used the recording unit one too many times, and the GM decided that he'd try to punish me for it. So when I mentioned to some authority figures that Roy has information about what we're looking for, they basically were, basically were like, okay, we're confiscating that piece of technology from you. It's got evidence of the case. And I'm like, oh, fuck no. And of course, because I'm fucking not charismatic at all, good luck changing their minds, but no. This is where, um, this is where Tobel of House Roan stepped in. And at this point in time, we were already juggling with the idea of having, like, fake IDs. You know, so no one could directly tie us to anything, because we weren't, we weren't planning on doing anything overtly evil or, like, illegal. But at the same time, we're trying to steal back a priceless artifact that was stolen from us. So, yeah. A couple of laws might be broken. He basically forged legal documents that confirmed he's a lawyer. It's 
Fucking great. Bob Nobley, attorney at law. <laughs> oh, it was great. It's still a running joke now, actually. Um, he was able to, through a fucking great, I don't even know if it was diplomacy, deception, or whatever, but he was able to convince the authorities to give him back. It meant so much to Jira that she plants a kiss on his cheek, and uh, Roy kind of gives him this... He's, he's a fucking wristwatch, but he gives him like this artificial hug, which was... He was like, thank you. Uh, and that that's... That was genuine. That was some genuine role-playing right there, because I would have been pissed if Roy... if had Roy been taken from me. Genuinely. Jira would have been devastated. Yeah. You, know, you save Roy, you're on her good side for a long time to come. Um, so, uh, I mean, Jira made it a point to get to know Tobal a little better at that point, because at that point in time, she basically considered him a friend. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Next up, jumping ahead a little bit more, we got jobs respectively. Uh, I kept on. Roy was still a badass when it came to piloting the drone. Uh, he was able to escape when we did something legit or illegal. I dropped the drone right on top of the enemies. And again, this was before I actually knew anything about, like, the system. So when I was given the choice, do you not, like, do you just drop it on them? Or do you, like, f fly down to the point where it doesn't smash into the ground? I, I Admittedly, at the time, I was a little hesitant to just do that. So I just dropped it. Turns out, yeah, with a successful pilot check, it'll just go, like, like, low enough to crush them, but it won't damage the fucking drone. But through a successful pilot check, Roy was able to get it, this busted-ass drone, off the ground, up, 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 out into space and hidden on one of the moons. And we were eventually able to retrieve it and repair it, which... I felt really terrible, cause uh, yeah, I I could I should have just piloted it. It's a new system. Get off my back. And uh, so anyway, we get, we find out where Rhododermus hiding. Uh, Rhododermus legacy, and we use Roy to kind of scout out ahead, cause he's fucking tiny. He's stealthy. He's got this. Uh, he helped us disable uh, audio traps. Uh, he helped us find out exactly the best route to take to get into Rotom's legacy. Um, and we basically stopped them. Like, it, it wasn't exactly a tough fight because they were cultists. Uh, all things considered, the campaign ended a lot sooner than we anticipated because all of this was going to be building up to something a lot bigger. All of this was building up to something a lot bigger. While we're exploring these caverns, I eventually find this giant gem. About, actually about that big. And it kind of looks like the Nabu Peace Globe from Phantom Menace, but not quite as vibrant. Inside the chest cavity of a skeleton. Didn't actually think twice about it at the time. I was like, oh, that's nasty, but what the fuck is this? Ooh, okay, gem. Nice. I thought it was just some bling at the time. Oh, how wrong I was. There's some funny shit that happens with uh, Bob Nobley, attorney at law, where we incarcerate a child for the Rotom's legacy, break him out, legally, on parole, use him to get to, like, sorry, use him to find out, like, what they were doing down there by basically following by following him back, then locking him up again 
<laughs> because he broke curfew or he broke his parole. Um, and plus, I think Tobal wanted his money back for like the bail money. <laughs> Um, and eventually we, we basically stop Rotoderm, Rotoderm's legacy from, uh, doing whatever it was they were planning to, planning to do, which was opening up a door and resurrecting Rotoderm, their, what, who they believe to be their god. <clears throat> so, we decide that we've got the amulet, you know, our, our mercenaries are going to be around for like a few more days at most, and we can't afford to pay them anymore. And it's not exactly a wise idea to just send them off to Kashyyyk for it to you know, be stolen again without our assistance. So we'll get some more supplies we need from here. We'll finish up repairs. And then all of us, mercenaries and ourselves, we will head to Kashyyyk together with everything in tow. <clears throat> and uh, hopefully we won't be ambushed again on the way back. Um, we decide on our last day before departing that we're gonna find out what we can about this rhododerm. So, during this time, during the time that we're on this planet, uh, Jess has been making money on uh, as a librarian. You know, uh, she would work days to just keep the the income. So, we go to her library and we use her expertise to, you know, find out books that might lead to whatever the fuck it was that who was this rotoderm what the hell happened you know x amount of years ago um and it's at this point in time where i'm just like okay you you do this and while you're doing that i'm gonna make sure that the you know everything around here is hunky-dory i'm gonna make sure that the ship's fine i'm gonna make sure that the mercenaries know what's up you know you and you and tobel do this real quick you and you and tobel do this I'm, I'm gonna be over here with roy and so I hand, so I hand her the uh, the amulet. And by this point, sorry, uh, this this gem, I hand, I hand her this big off fuck off gem. Now at this time, uh, Jess was the one who was carrying the amulet because we had found the stolen amulet and she had it in her possession and all that other stuff where we f were trying to find out what the fuck was going on with, with Rotoderm's legacy. That kind of happened as a result of us stealing it back. We had to fend off some more cultists, and we had to fend off some of Kratos speeders, right? Who may or may not have had direct ties to Mandalore, because they had the Mandalorian symbol as a tattoo on their arm. Uh, never actually made it that far. Because uh, as soon as I handed to her this gem, this fuck-off Naboo Peace Globe wannabe motherfucker, as soon as I handed it to her, and both the gem and the amulet are in her possession, the GM confirms that I handed the gem to her, and he confirms that she has the amulet and the gem in her possession. He then says, Jess, hand me your character sheet. She complies, and he's like, your character is dead. And we're like, what? He's like, yeah. Your character's eyes fade uh, light begins to emulate from the gem and the amulet, and you begin floating in air. The amulet resonates uh, on your person, uh, in your bag, and the amulet floats out of your grasp at chest level and begins to move toward your chest cavity. So Tobal and I, so Tobal and I were like, oh, fuck no. And we spend the next four rounds trying to either A, stop the gem from entering her chest cavity, B, breaking the damn thing with blaster fire, or C, you know, getting the fucking amulet away from her. Spoiler alert, none of those three things happened. <laughs> None of those three happened for like the next four rounds. And by round five, we knew that there was nothing we can do. We're like, oh fuck, oh fuck. I'm so sorry, man. We're, I, I'm so sorry. We, we fucking, uh, we fucking turn tables over. We duck behind them and we're blasting at the, at the fucking gem trying to break the damn thing. It doesn't work. 
because it turns out, and this was planned from the very fucking beginning, if we found the gem and we had the gem and the amulet at the same time, like on one person, the spirit of Rotoderm would come back and possess us. The one who was holding both at the same time. So... Boom! Big shockwave ra rocks the entire library that we're in. Pretty much everyone else dies. We're high enough level at this point. Where the, where the debris doesn't kill us, but we're banged up hard. Roy was lucky enough to not be damaged in this. Thank fuck. Thank fuck he wasn't damaged with this because, yeah, he's got a, de he's got a de defense of 25, but his, like, his total health is 7. Like, a rock that lands on him from, the, from a fucking roof height is going to fucking destroy him. It's going to squash him. Uh, so, eventually, Jess, Jess's body is basically enveloped in this Sith light and flies up and out, kind of Dragon Ball style. And I realize we've got one shot at this. Like, maybe one chance to, to stop this. And so I have Roy call in the drone. And so Roy pilots a freshly repaired droid drone from its, uh, from its garage to our location. And this thing is fast. This thing is damn fast. And it's, it's a fucking good thing it was, because otherwise we wouldn't have fucking made it. Drone comes in, comes along, matches, uh, matches Rotoderm's spirit in possession of Chess's body. And the night is coming along at this point. We're reaching the point where it's about time for us to head home anyway. So whatever we're gonna be doing, it's gonna be done in one of two ways. A, it's gonna be done real quick. Or B, it's gonna wait until next week. So the GM picks up his dice tray, picks up a d20 and goes, uh, Anvil, Jira, you and I, just a roll off. No mods, just no mods, just straight D twenty roll. Boom, rolls his die. It's open, but we're not looking at it. I am nervous as fuck right now because, yeah, this is the the option. This is the only thing that can be done. This one roll is going to determine what happens. Whether I succeed or fail, I am pretty much directly responsible for killing a, a fellow player character. And at this point, I just feel fucking horrible, but I need to make this work. So I pick up, I pick up my metal die, shake it around, into the dice tray. 16, not bad. Uh, but I roll, and as soon as I roll, I raise my hands up, I back away from that dice tray as far as I can while still sitting down, and I go, NATURAL 20! And so the Tobel and Jess are like, whoa, whoa, yeah! Mm. It's fucking great. And then, the GM tells us what he rolled. Not one. <laughs> Not one, baby. And it was described to us through the uh, through Roy's sensors via the drone that the droid drone, under the direct piloting skills of Roy, this little fucking wristwatch droid, one shot what was supposed to be the campaign's big bad <laughs> and thus Roy the God Slayer was born 
It was a fucking great night at that point. We we beat the campaign vastly, uh, vastly sooner than the GM was ever expecting. And um, we did lose a player character, but we went out on a blaze of glory. And uh, the only negative thing to all of this was that um, we were a bit too drunk on hype to let our characters retire then. We played our characters for a bit longer than that. Jess's player uh, made a new one uh, called Dwayne, Dwayne the Wook Johnson, a Wookie. But um, yeah, it was it was a blast. Something else that uh, is noteworthy is that at first this was Roy's sheet. This was Roy's sheet, because Roy was that kind of like extension NPC that was never supposed to grow, never supposed to change, and at some point in time was basically going to be redundant or irrelevant as we leveled up. But as a result of defeating the big bad in one stroke, Roy got his own character sheet. And a level up. <laughs> Roy got himself his own level up. His own character sheet. And... It was fantastic. Um, this is not the sheet that was printed. I, I can't find that one. This one is in black and white. His... Like, his actual official printed sheet, it's got color. Because you respect Roy the Godslayer. Roy the Godslayer will fuck you up. He will tell the time as he kills you. <laughs> time of death? Oh, now. Uh, he got himself a Dunian shell, which basically added a two-point damage reduction and a five damage reduction versus ion-based attacks. And, uh... It was pretty fucking great. And that's, uh... something of an abbreviated store version of, uh... Roy the God Slayer. Although he technically didn't actually fell a god... It was this ancient Sith ghost. But still, he was basically a god in the sense that he was able to possess a living body and come back from after death. And if it weren't for the Nat 1 versus the Natural 20, probably would have lived to fight another day and cause us a major pain later on down the road. But, uh... To this day, Jirahai remains one of my favorite characters that I've ever played. And, uh... Roy is no small reason for that. Roy's a pretty big reason for why I had so much fun with her. Because, you know what? It's something of a little... Uh, it's something of a story of the little droid that could. So I guess that's uh that's my that's my time. Uh, I guess have yourselves a great night. And uh, live long and prosper. <laughs>